Okay, for um, this part of the program, we're going to uh, get into some uh, analysis and discussion about the results that we've just heard about, and uh, we want to kick things off with Ambassador Schieffer, and uh, I think he'll be speaking from, from the uh, stage here. So, Ambassador Schieffer, it's over to you. Well, thank you, Dan. It's, it's a great to be with you again. That Dan Bob is not a Texan, but I know that if he <laughs> went to Texas, he would be welcome. Now, people would ask him what his last name was, but, but he would be welcome. <laughs> uh, I think this is a very interesting uh, survey, and I think there's a lot of good news in it. Uh, and I don't say this for, uh, uh, with uh, any irony in it, but I think we can say that the war is finally over between the United States and Japan. And I don't say that lightly, uh, because I think, as the survey also shows, there is still a legacy of war um, in Northeast Asia in particular. Uh, and it is one that has not been overcome. I think the great lesson here is what the United States and Japan did to have this situation where 68% of Americans trust Japanese, 75% of Japanese trust Americans. I think what we decided to do early on was talk about the future and not the past. And because <laughs> we talked about the future, uh, we didn't forget the past, but because we talked about the future, we talked about creating institutions and a culture of working together that permeates this whole uh, survey. Now, one of the things that I find very interesting in the survey is on the stereotypes. It is not hard for me to think that Americans, 94, 95% of Americans, think that the Japanese are hardworking. Uh, it is also not a surprise to me <laughs> to see that the Japanese at 24, 25%, whatever it is, think uh, Americans are not as hardworking. Um, I would venture to say that the Japanese are the hardest working people in the world. And while I wish they thought we worked harder, I'm not surprised that they don't think so, but I would guess that they might be surveyed on other countries as well and might not think they're as hard working either. And I think that has to do with, with Japan and, and its desire to make every minute count. Uh, so I don't, I don't, worry about that too much. The, one of the things that I find ironic, though, in the survey is on the question of honesty. Here you have Japan trusting the United States at a 75% level, and yet on honesty, 37%, only 37% of Japanese think that the American people are, are honest. I don't see how you get to that conclusion. Uh, how can you be trustworthy and not be honest? Uh, but I think that also is a legacy of some of the post-war, uh, and, and uh, Americans are perceived as much more aggressive by Japanese than Japanese are perceived by Americans. Those two things, uh, honesty and aggressiveness, I think may have something to do with one of the unfortunate parts of American-Japanese relationships uh, since the end of the war. And that is gaiatsu, or the, the understanding that what does America want? Uh, what does America demand? And I think too often in our relationship, that has driven a lot of our politics, a lot of our relationship. And it's, it's a political game in many, in many respects. Uh, Americans are sometimes, Americans in policy making positions are sometimes uh, encouraged by Japanese to make their views public uh, so that the Japanese can respond as what choice did we have. Now that has given Japanese politicians some cover in the past. Uh, we have a relationship that has worked very well, so you can't just say, well, we, we shouldn't go down that road. But I think we've reached a point now 
in which we should stop relying on that kind of policy making on both sides. I think it is extraordinarily important for the Japanese people to understand that it is not what America demands of Japan, it is what the Japanese feel is in their best interest. Uh, and that's what should drive our relationship as we go forward. Uh, we, have, we have gone far beyond that period uh, when Japanese should think that America demands that they be a partner in an alliance. I think we've reached the point where we really should approach the future alliance on a uh, partnership basis of equal partners. I think it is remarkable that uh, Prime Minister Abe has made some of the forays that he has in the areas of defense and security. And when you talk about collective self-defense, and the Japanese are obviously in, uh, in still in conversation about it, they still have some reservations about it, but collective self-defense to me is an extraordinarily important issue because what it says is that Japan, in very limited circumstances, will come to the aid of the United States if the United States were attacked. Uh, I think that is really important because the future of our alliance cannot be so one-sided that only the United States has to come to, defense, to the defense of Japan. There has to be some sort of reciprocity. In the Cold War, it didn't make a difference because the timeline was such that uh, Japan couldn't respond. If a nuclear uh, missile was launched in um, the Soviet Union against the United States, there wasn't much that Japan could do about that. Technology has changed that to where now you have missile defense on both our sides and Japan can come to the defense of the United States if a missile is launched toward the United States and a Japanese destroyer, for instance, could knock it down. I think it would be very difficult for the American people to understand if a Japanese destroyer had a chance to knock down a missile headed for the United States and didn't take it because under, under a strict interpretation of the security agreement, they don't have to. But if that missile landed on American soil, I think it would be very difficult for Americans to understand how an ally could allow that to happen. So I think that is a big, big issue. And I think Japan is moving uh, in a very forthright uh, way to try to fill in some of those gaps that exist. But again, that is something that the Japanese people have to decide is important for their security, not just for ours, but their security. And I think this survey shows you that there is a movement toward a recognition in Japan of, uh, of the need to make some changes in the security posture. I thought the economic issues were very interesting with regard to what had happened here, particularly on the trade wars. And I, and I agree with Dan, uh, in the 80s and 90s, uh, if, if this survey were taken, the results would have been very different. But the Japanese did something that was very wise, and that is they recognized that just exporting product to the United States was causing a problem. And so what they did was they made a huge move toward investing in the United States. Now 75% of the Toyotas that are made in America, uh, that are sold in America, are made in America. It makes a big difference when a, an American works at a Toyota factory or a Japanese factory and, and, and the Japanese are creating jobs in America, which they clearly have done. And all of a sudden, trade is much more understandable. It's much more uh, a part of the process and not something to be demonized uh, on the part of the other country. Hopefully, that trend that you see reflected in this poll will be continued with the TPP negotiations and that we will truly have two economies that are integrated in a way that they have not been in the past. I think that that will be 
have even greater influence on the poll that's taken 10, 15, 20 years from now than it is shown here. But clearly, we don't have that animosity. We don't have that problem that we had 20, 30 years ago. Uh, I want to say something about the politics of, uh, that is reflected in this. And it's not something I'm proud of. But I think it is something that all of us in this room need to be aware of. I would guess that most of the people that are here today think about Japan a lot. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. Unfortunately, I'm afraid it creates an elite as opposed to a large public awareness. In this survey, if you go back to the back, it talks about Japanese and, and the sushi is the, the leading thing that Americans think about when they think about Japan. Well, I like sushi. I liked sushi before I went to Japan. I like it. I still like it. I realize how much better it is in Japan than it is in the United States now. But I still like it. But when you look down and people are asked, and it's a very small sampling. It's 100 of the, of the 1,000 sampling. But when people are asked to what they think of Prime Minister Koizumi, uh, Prime Minister Abe, 12% uh, of Americans have a favorable uh, view of uh, Prime Minister uh, Koizumi. 11% have a favorable view of uh, Prime Minister Abe. 9% have an unfavorable. 73% never heard of either one of them. This, ladies and gentlemen, is a prescription for disaster on a long-term basis. Americans have to become more aware of the rest of the world than they are today. This does not pertain only to Japan when I say this. But one thing that I noticed when I served in Australia and in Japan is a problem that I don't have a solution for. But the presidential primaries in, in the United States are front page news in Australia and Japan. I'm talking about the caucuses, the primaries, who's up, who's down, and all that. They're lucky to make any page of the paper in the United States. Now, I think part of that is explainable by the fact that the United States has been the dominant power in the world uh, since the end of the war. And so, Countries all over the world are interested in what we're doing and in, in, in the face of what we're doing. But Americans need to be less focused on themselves and more focused on the larger world that we live in. That would be good for the United States and for the rest of the world. Now having said that, I think we've done a pretty good job. I think the, the world is a much different and a much better place than it was at the end of the war. And I think the role that the United States has played in, that war, in, in making that happen is something that all Americans could be proud of. But I don't take comfort when I see the numbers so low uh, as, as the awareness of Americans about specific things that are going on in Japan. And I think that that is a challenge to everybody in this room to try to figure out how we can get the message that the elites are aware of out to a broader public. Because in the end, I look out on Northeast Asia and I see a United States and Japan that share the same common ground on the future. And I say that in this way. I think United States policy in Northeast Asia might change with regard to some situations. If you look at the Korean Peninsula, for instance, if the Korean Peninsula were united, <coughs> our policy might be somewhat different than it is today toward South Korea, for instance. Not that it would be worse, not that it would be bad, it just might be different. If you look at the situation with Taiwan and China, if there were a reconciliation between China and Taiwan, I think our policy toward Taiwan might be different. Doesn't mean it would be worse, uh, might be better, but I think it might be different. But I don't see a place anywhere in Northeast Asia where the interest of Japan and the interest of the United States are going to cause a difference in long-term strategic policy toward one another. I just don't. And so I am very 
happy to see that the U.S.-Japan alliance is so highly regarded in both places and is regarded as important to the security of both places. So I end, I hope, on that happy note. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Schieffer. Really appreciate that. And uh, now to, to our final speaker, Mr. Akita from uh, Nikkei. Thank you. Thank you. I just borrowed a very expensive watch of Ambassador Schiffer. <laughs> this shows how a friendship between US and Japan is strong. <laughs> thank you. So thank you very much for inviting me today. <clears throat> I'm very honored to be here. And I'm also very glad to know that the stereotype image of Japan, Japanese from American uh, point of view is hardworking and uh, inventive. But uh, I think that the Japanese journalist is uh, unfortunately maybe less hardworking or less, uh, could be less inventive. But uh, so I'm not sure uh, to how much extent I'm qualified to represent Japanese average view. But uh, I, at least in this room, I try to be very hardworking Japanese journalist. So anyway, uh, based on, maybe based on, uh, uh, mainly based on the pure research uh, poll result, I'd like to make uh, three comments. One is about uh, uh, U.S. and American perception difference, or maybe gap, about uh, Asian security situation. Second, uh, I'd like to also mention that uh, to how much extent Japanese public support a very proactive security policy initiated by Prime Minister Abe. And thirdly, in that context, I'd like to <coughs> touch upon and the Japanese public view on the U.S.-Japan alliance. So um, please look at uh, this poll. Uh, this is a poll conducted by cabinet office uh, this January. And this shows that how Japanese people worried about its security situation, uh, being asked if there is a risk for Japan to be caught or involved in a war. Uh, 28% percent of people think that there is a risk, and 47 percent of the people think that there is a risk in some degree. So this number is very big. Uh, 70 percent, 75 percent of Japanese publics think that there could be a danger that Japan will get, will be caught in the war. Um, they, this poll also asked uh, the reason why, and most Japanese people answered that there is a more tension on conflict in the world. It's, and they didn't specifically mention about uh, what region or which country, but uh, as we observe from Tokyo, uh, Chinese military uh, activity is becoming more and more visible in South China Sea or East China Sea. I'm not criticizing it, but uh, I'm just telling facts. And also North Korean nuclear program is getting accelerated. And Japan is within the range of a ballistic missile of North Korea. And so uh, Japanese people, it's kind of like a natural for Japanese people to worry more about its security. But uh, as Pew uh, poll results show, uh, American public perception about Japanese security situation is a little bit different, or quite different. It shows that uh, only little uh, American public know uh, American public knows only little about uh, the tension between Japan, China over Senkak Island, or uh, what is going on in Korean Peninsula. And I think it is very natural, because after all, uh, US is a very far away from Asia, and the US is separated by the ocean. So I think that it is natural. Uh, different political location create different perception. Um, but uh, let me touch up. So this uh, poll shows uh, uh, the kind of like a difference of perception between US and Japan. And this is a poll conducted by 
uh, Yomiur newspaper and Gallup con uh, jointly last November. And uh, they asked about the source of potential military threat. And Japan, Japanese public think that China is first biggest. Uh, and then North Korea, and then Russia. And strange, I think it is very strange, but fourth is South Korea. I don't think that South Korea will invade Japan. <laughs> uh, though we have a history problem, we are a friendly country, but uh, sometimes Paul shows a very strange uh, result. So anyway, it's a mystery. And then uh, American public think that China is fourth threat, less threatening than North Korea. And of course, Middle East is the biggest threat for American. Uh, still, I think that it is very natural. But uh, I think that, uh, as uh, Ambassador Shifa mentioned, that uh, this perception gap or difference of the perception could be a source of a friction in the future if US and Japan wants to coordinate this security policy more closer, or if there is uh, some contingency in Asia. And then the uh, next question is that, uh, so. This sense of vulnerability by Japanese public, how is it being translated into uh, their attitude toward the uh, secu proactive security policy led by Prime Minister Abe? And we can, uh, some may assume that uh, since Japan is more worried about its own security, so Japanese people more inclined to support more proactive security policy by Abe's administration. But, uh, or maybe some people assume that uh, since Japan feel worried about Japanese security, it will uh, stimulate Japanese nationalism, and then maybe that make uh, Japan lean toward more right politically. But this poll shows that is not the, at least a poll shows that is not the case. Uh, asked about the, whether they will support expansion of overseas operations by self-defense forces. Um, you know, these two uh, poll, polls conducted last month shows that Japanese public uh, is highly divided, uh, almost even favorable and unfavorable. And same thing can be said about uh, collective uh, self-defense. Uh, Ambassador Shifa, as, as Ambassador Shifa mentioned, uh, Prime Minister Abe is trying to uh, pass legislations, legislation to, for Japan to be able to exercise collective self-defense for the first time after the war, uh, World War II. And he already changed the interpretation of the uh, Constitution to make it possible last July. Then asked about the legislation to exercise collective uh, self-defense. It's also very divided. Nikkei, Asahi, uh, Mainichi, NHK, all polls shows that uh, 20 to 30 people are supportive, favorable, but 50% uh, or 40% of people are unfavorable. So uh, I think that there is a discrepancy between, the Japanese, between Japanese threat perception or sense of vulnerability and its attitude toward a security policy. A Japanese people worried, but the, they are still cautious for Japan to uh, expand uh, overseas military operations. Um, <clears throat> even though Abe, Prime Minister Abe is trying to do it, trying to do it, do it to further strengthen U.S.-Japan security cooperations, and also uh, he intends to uh, do more to contribute uh, uh, stability, peace and stability in the region. So I wonder why. Then uh, maybe let's skip uh, revision of constitution. I think that the one easiest answer is uh, Pacific, Pacific constitution given, well, made and given by United States is too good. And so Japanese people, uh, Pacific uh, sentiment of Japanese people 
is still very deep rooted, rooted, and it is they remain the same. In other words, uh, Japanese people public may think this way. Uh, they are very very willing to uh, actually. Uh, another, another poll shows that Japanese public fully support to for stronger U.S.-Japan alliance, and Japanese public fully support that. Uh, policies to do more to further strengthen U.S.-Japan security cooperation in the context of rise of China or North Korean crisis. And Japanese people also uh, fully, not fully, but uh, more or less support uh, increase of defense budget. And now Japanese defense budget is uh, to GDP ratio is like 0.8%, but I think that Japan can expand it uh, much more at least to the level of the 1% or 1.5. The uh, public is not opposing to that, but uh, they worry that once break, break is removed, maybe uh, overseas operation will expand without any limit. So they still are, uh, there is still this kind of concern. But uh, I think a second reason, and which is more, uh, Relevant reason is that credibility to of U.S. Japan security treaty, security treaty is very very strong, and this poll uh, shows that. Oh, this uh, they ask about uh, uh, U.S. Japan security treaty. Is it helpful for the security in Asian Pacific? Not only the uh, defense of Japan, but the Asian Pacific. And 27 uh, Japanese. People think that it is very helpful, and 46% relatively helpful. So, uh, about 75% of Japanese people believe that U.S.-Japan Security Treaty is helpful not only for Japan but also for Asian security region. It is uh, this number is 10% higher than that of American public respondent. So, uh, whether it is good or bad. Uh, I think that Japanese people fully, uh, Japanese people's cred credibility to this uh, alliance is so strong that uh, they believe that we can still rely on this uh, treaty or this alliance. So maybe that is one of the reasons of the discrepancy. Lastly, I think I have a few minutes, so please let me explain, uh, touch upon the revision of the Constitution in this context. Uh, Prime Minister, uh, Abe administration is trying to uh, create momentum for the more uh, vital, uh, active discussion for the revision of the Japanese Constitution. And this poll uh, conducted in this January shows that uh, public is highly divided. Uh, 30, uh, uh, according to the Nikkei poll, uh, maybe 40% are favorable, a little bit less than 40% are favorable, and 45% are favorable. And the Yomiuri poll shows that 51% uh, are favorable and 46% uh, are favorable. But I think that this number is still quite high. Maybe in 20 or 30 years ago, a uh, favorable number would, uh, was maybe uh, much lower, I think. So it is high, as uh, I more than I imagined. But uh, still, it's highly divided. But uh, uh, when asked about specific, when Paul asked about specifically Constitution Article Nine, which renounce, which renounces a war, of vast majority of Japanese people say they don't want to change it. So it is very puzzling. Japanese, half or th one third of Japanese people wants to revise constitution, but they don't want to revise Article 9, which is the essence, pacific essence of Article 9. So it is very strange, uh, not strange, puzzling, but I think this way. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, you know, my mother or always choose clothes for me to wear. But as we grown up, we want to choose clothes, what to wear, decide what to wear by myself. Then we 
now Japan won't do it. But the clothes, design, of the cl design or color of the clothes Japan wants to choose is same as <laughs> the one which was given by the United States, more or less. But the action to decide by itself and choose and adopt is very, very important for Japan. Maybe I think that this number shows that uh, this uh, reality. Thank you. Thank you very much, Akita-san. Um, really appreciate those comments. And now uh, we'd like to get into a discussion amongst our, our panelists before we open to the uh, floor. And uh, if I might just begin with a question. Um, as we all know, Prime Minister Abe is here in three weeks or so. He'll be making the first official trip by a prime minister in nine years, uh, partly as a result of many short-term prime ministers not having had the ability to, to come here. Um, but uh, as Ambassador Schieffer mentioned, 73% of Americans don't know who Mr. Abe is. Uh, he'll be giving a, a, a speech the first time ever before a joint session of Congress for a Japanese prime minister. And uh, based on, on some of the background that we've been discussing today, I'm just curious if uh, any of you might have some thoughts on, on the sorts of things that he might want to cover in his speech before a joint session of Congress or more generally while he's here. He'll also be, of course, in, Bo in addition to Washington and Boston, in San Francisco and in uh, Los Angeles, but uh, just wondering if any of you had some thoughts on that. Since I'm only Japanese here, so maybe I'm, I'm responsible to answer <laughs> first. I think that the, uh, uh, he, Abe's uh, Prime Minister, I think that uh, speech at the joint session is one of the most important event in Washington. Uh, because uh, <coughs> while uh, Germany pr German Prime Minister or South Korean president have made a speech like five times, uh, but uh, it is the first time for a Japanese prime minister to make a speech at a joint session. So uh, there is a symbolism. But the uh, substance is also important. Uh, as we uh, discussed, uh, Prime Minister Abe seeks for more uh, active, proactive security policy. Uh, to uh, do more to, to contribute to the stability and uh, peace and stability in the region, of, uh, for example, collective defense, right? Self defense. So uh, he wants to uh, send a message that now Japan also thinks that this alliance is not only for bilateral, but uh, global, not only in the domain of security, uh, security but also. Uh, environment, or TPP, or there, there are many elements. So they want to send that message to the uh, Congress. And also, in order, to, in order for future-oriented relation, uh, we have to have a very correct recognition about the past. So I think that the, he will also mention about history. And it's very difficult to predict his wording I, as a journalist, I think that that is one of the most risky uh, things to do is to uh, predict what the leader will say in coming weeks. But uh, I think he will touch upon history too. Thank you. Ambassador. Uh, I agree with Akita san that this is a, a big speech for the prime minister and it is anticipated been anticipated in Japan for a long time. I think the Prime Minister's, uh, and not this specific speech, but the 70th anniversary of the end of the war uh, as to what he should say in, in the year that that occurs. So I think that he looks upon, I, I don't know, I don't certainly don't speak for him, but I think he has to speak in a way uh, about history. Uh, I think we have seen by this survey that history uh, is really in Americans' rearview mirrors. But having said that, uh, if he doesn't mention history, that will be the headline. Um, and I don't think that's the headline that he wants to make. 
So I think he needs to say something about the historical issues in, in a positive way and point out that uh, Japan has been a model citizen of the international community for 70 years, and that ought to count for something. Uh, having said that, I, th I think that the Prime Minister is looking forward to this opportunity uh, and sees it as an opportunity, and I hope that Americans will realize uh, that this is a big speech and that what he wants to do, I believe, is to set the tone for the future and how we can work together and how we share so many values in the world, but we share so many policy goals in the world. And I think that that should be reassuring to Americans, and I hope it is reassuring to the Japanese as well, and I expect it will be. If I could also just ask, um, I thought one of the interesting findings, Bruce, was the uh, fact that Americans trust Japan more to play an active military role than the Japanese trust themselves. And I uh, wonder if you could just give a few insights into that, uh, how that may have compared previously uh, and where it may go uh, forward. I mean, it wasn't so long ago, I remember, when just the subject of uh, collective self-defense or constitutional reinterpretation was completely taboo subject 20, 25 years ago. You simply couldn't talk about it. Even, even uh, editors of major newspapers would not uh, write anything about it. It was just simply taboo. Well, I, I think it's an interesting question, and I think one of the, um, uh, we don't have any trend data on this, uh, at least at Pew, so we can't, I thought it was interesting to, the Kisan surveys in Japan about um, basically a division on this. We like to do more overseas, but really we don't want to change anything. Uh, there's, a, there's obviously some uh, contradiction in people's emotions about this, uh, which I think is, is terribly typical. Um, what I found interesting in our survey in the United States is I frankly expected Americans to be more supportive of Japan doing more militarily in the region, simply because we know there's been a long sense in the United States that we bear so many military burdens around the world. We'd like more burden sharing. And given the fact that history does seem to be in the rearview mirror of Americans, uh, the fact that we were actually kind of still divided on this issue, I found a little bit surprising. Um, uh, now, um, my guess is that will change and evolve over time uh, as we get further away from the war, as um, uh, there, the issue of, of peace and security in Asia becomes maybe more of a, an important issue for us. Um, uh, I can only imagine that, again, you don't know what respondents were thinking when you asked them the question. But they could have said, Sure, we take on too much of this burden, let the Japanese take more. Well, they didn't say that. Um, uh, does that mean that there may be still some reticence here that, that Japan could, could somehow get us involved in things we'd rather not get involved with in terms of China or whatever? I don't know. I mean, again, you, you can't, George Gallup used to say, you ask people a question, they give you an answer, don't overinterpret it because you're projecting your own uh, feelings onto what they they told you. We don't know what they why they said this, but it is interesting that they were divided on the issue. Um, uh, uh, but I do I would imagine that will continue to evolve over time because uh, clearly we also know that the American public is weary uh, in terms of its if it the burdens it has taken uh, militarily around the world. I can't imagine that's going to get much better over time. It probably only will, the weariness will only grow. Yeah, uh, I explained the poll about the collective self-defense, which is highly divided. But uh, there's another poll uh, which asked about, asked a Japanese public that, do you know about the content of the registration or do you know about the, to how much extent, Jap to, or how will Japan exercise 
collective safe defense in, in part scenario. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I forgot the number, but uh, most of the people don't know. Uh, there are many, many reports about new uh, definition of kind of a limited uh, collective self defense. But uh, it is very, very discussion about the registration and the uh, criteria for Japan to exercise uh, collective self defense. And it's limited. Uh, limited. Uh, Japan is only when Japan is uh, threatened its survivability, uh, Japan will conduct. So uh, Japanese people don't understand. That is the reason why I think, that is one of the reasons why public is divided. But if uh, Japanese public know, uh, you know, were explained that, as uh, Ambassador Shifa said, when U.S. is under attack, when U.S. is patrolling around, you know, uh, when they are patrolling around Japanese, uh, surrounding Japan, uh, near Japan, then self-defense forces, whether self-defense forces should respond. I think that, that is collective self-defense. I think that the, you know, nine, more than 90% or 80% of people say that Japan should. But uh, when there is, uh, uh, there, when, if there are war in the Middle East, and uh, there is a mine deployed in the Persian Gulf, and whether Japan should exercise collective self-defense, and then sweep it, do mine sweeping in the time of the war. That is also regarded as a use of force. And that is a kind of gray line, gray zone. So this kind of uh, discussion is very, very highly uh, complex, and people still, that's the reason why people still, but I think the trend, it's divided, but I think the trend is toward a more pro supportive uh, position toward uh, more, uh, to a uh, more proactive security policy. And though it is divided, but trend is more proactive, I think. Just to follow up on this, how much of that uh, movement in that direction has to do with China's uh, actions? Related to China's actions? Right. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, I think it's highly, deeply related. Japan is a very vulnerable country, surrounded by sea, and there are not so many natural resources. So Japan, uh, I think that um, in past 20 or 30 years, Japanese uh, security policy or has been driven by external shock, North Korean nuclear test or North Korean uh, launch or ballistic missile, and also uh, China's very active military uh, operation. So I think that uh, Japan is not so spontaneously moving, but uh, reactive or adaptive. So, mm -hmm. I think. And Satu, if I could ask you, uh, just sort of impressionistically, um, you, you've, as, you, as you go through all the materials that you put together, all the statistics and so forth, it's clear how pervasive uh, Japan's uh, been uh, involved in U.S. Uh, across uh, any number of sectors. Um, we didn't do this specifically in the poll, and I'm not sure how easily it, it could be done, mm -hmm. but how much of that uh, distribution of uh, Japanese uh, companies, the jobs created and so forth, do you think has, has created such a, well, really positive view of, of Japan that's reflected in, in, in the poll that Pew did? Yeah, um, thanks, Dan. Um, in fact, um, Bruce and I were just talking about this. Would there be a way to overlap uh, Japan's interactions and, quote, footprint or impacts across the U.S with the polling data. Could you draw um, a correlation, if not a causation, between um, the, let's call it the, the, the Japan factor locally and the attitudes? Um, you know, and this segues a little bit to your first question about Mr. Uh, Pre uh, Prime Minister Abe's visit. You know, I was thinking of his um, schedule. You know, there, it's, bi it's a bi-coastal bi schedule. Mm -hmm. And what really struck me about our data set is, as I said at the outset, is um, Japan is so important across the United States. So if you disaggregate, and again, uh, you know, in any kind of such type of work, you can do layers upon layers of disaggregation and computation. But the bottom line is, what strikes me is, Japan is so important across the United States, whether it's manufacturing across 
uh, the South, um, whether it's agricultural issues in the Midwest and other places, certainly for my state, Washington State, huge impact. So um, while this trip obviously is welcome and the joint session uh, speech is welcome, I, I was just thinking um, there would be a great way to sh for the Prime Minister to indicate how important Japan is to the whole of the United States, quite beyond historical, and it's a way of framing the future too, is what more can be done to further um, build and strengthen these kinds of dynamics across the country between our two countries. If I could add, uh, we, because uh, uh, of the limitations of any survey, you only can interview so many people, it, it, you, you really can't get it state by state in terms of, say, trust of Japan, because the, the N would not be big enough in any one state to have a statistically significant response. But you can aggregate them by region. And what's interesting in our data, because we've done that, is that the least trust of Japan is in the South, which I must admit I found counterintuitive because the, some of the most prominent examples of Japanese job-creating investment in the United States have been in the South, in Tennessee, in Kentucky, Alabama, et cetera. So um, what that might suggest, and again, it it really requires much further analysis, is that kind of an economist's rationality about this all. It, 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 if, if you create jobs in our neighborhood, we're going to love you. And, and it, it's more complex than that. It may have to do with the fact that we do know that there's lower trust among non-whites than whites of Japan. Bear in mind that they both trust Japan, but they're slightly higher, and maybe because there's a larger non-white population in the South, maybe that's the reason. Maybe it's because there's a lower percentage of Asians in, in, in the South. I don't even know if that's true, but it has been suggested to us and that would be something to look at. Your data would also be very interesting to look at because it does seem to me that it would be interesting to know why there is some regional difference in the United States when, as you say, Japan really has had a across-the-board influence uh, on um, uh, the economy of the United States. Ambassador? Uh, Bruce is a statistician, and statisticians hate anecdotes, so I, I apologize for this anecdote. No, no, I'm a journalist, so I love <laughs> anecdotes. <laughs> but, but let me give you an anecdote that I, I think answers some of what you're just raising. Uh, the Toyota company opened a uh, truck uh, manufacturing site in San Antonio several years ago. Uh, the truck, I mean, the uh, plant has, it's a big employer. It's got a lot of publicity. In 2008, when the financial crisis hit, uh, they did something that's very normal for Japanese, not normal for an American company. Uh, the production, they were overproduction. They had to stop the production line. They didn't lay anybody off. What they did was they took the workers at the Toyota plant in San Antonio and had them go out into the community and volunteer. And they worked in parks and, and a number of uh, public institutions. They didn't lay them off. They had them doing something positive for the community. They took it very Japanese. Now let's fast forward to the last congressional election. Uh, a very enterprising young Hispanic named Julian uh, or Joaquin Castro, their brothers, um, <laughs> uh, twin brothers, uh, was elected to the Congress. Okay. Um, his very first year, uh, there was an effort to launch again a Japan caucus in the Congress. Joaquin is the co-chairman <laughs> of that caucus. What does that say? That says that, number one, I, he's a great guy, he's very smart, he's all that, but if the Japanese were very unpopular in San Antonio, he wouldn't be volunteering to be the co-chairman. And one of the things that I think we can do, and I, I agree with Bruce, I think in the South and really in the Midwest, you will find that, that Japan is not, there's not as great an awareness uh, about Japan as there are in the two coasts. Mm -hmm. And that's not unusual. I mean, when, Ameri when Australians come to the United States, they stop in Los Angeles, San Francisco, they go to New York, they go to Washington, Boston. Uh, 
and it's the second or third trip before they go to Chicago or Dallas, Fort Worth or Atlanta or places like that. And, and that, I think, is something that we can do better on. Bo both, both sides can do better. But where do Americans stop when they go to Japan? Tokyo. Uh, so, I mean, we can both be we can both be captives of our, of our own cultures here, but I think that by and large, Japan is becoming more and more, uh, people are becoming more and more aware of Japan because of Japanese investment in America. Mm -hmm. I, I was in Japan um, when the Aichi uh, affair was going on. There were 13 state delegations that visited uh, tr brought trade delegations to that fair and stopped in, in Tokyo. You could just count them. The governors, the senators were from states, and the people that, uh, that accompanied them were from states where there was a major Japanese investment in that state. West Virginia, uh, Tennessee, Texas, uh, places like that. So, I mean, it really does make a difference when we have greater integration of our two economies. And I think that gets back to the trade issue again and the importance of something like the TPP. This really makes a difference when we work together and we benefit from each other's capital and benefit from the relationship. Thanks. Uh, let me add just one other uh, anecdote, about, also about Toyota, actually. When, when they uh, invested in a major plant, uh, maybe the first plant that they built in the U.S. in the late 80s in Kentucky, uh, they, there, a number of states were competing with one another to provide uh, subsidies, uh, lower taxes, and so forth. Uh, Kentucky won, uh, and it spent, uh, if memory serves, about $100 million on these things. Incredibly uh, politically controversial. But as soon as, as they had made the decision uh, Toyota made a major effort at corporate citizenship. They did recruiting from, for their, their new laborers from every single uh, county in, uh, in the state uh, and created a whole bunch of jobs, integrated into the community, and within a couple of years they were beloved by the, the citizens of the state. And, and they were sort of on the leading edge of corporate citizenship, where, but a lot of other Japanese companies quickly learned about that, and it really, I think, helped set a much better tone. And this, of course, was in the midst of the, the bad old days of the 80s, uh, early 90s, when Japan was going to be taking over the world, ostensibly. Um, well, let me just give our, our uh, speakers a chance to, to comment on anything that any of you have said, uh, if there are any burning questions or, or thoughts that you wanted to get up, and then we'll, we'll open, to the, open to the floor. Anyone want to add something? I just wanted to actually uh, reinforce something Ambassador Schieffer said, which is a personal view and has nothing to do with the Pew Research Center's opinion, because we have no opinion about this. But the ambassador's uh, point that Americans <laughs> need to recognize that the world impacts them in ways that, that the world never impacted us before. And as a result, we bear a responsibility as citizens to uh, pay attention to the world, to follow the world. Uh, now, that can come off as condescending from elites. I mean, we spend our entire lives worrying about the world, and most people have real lives, and they don't have time to spend as much time as we do thinking about what's happening in faraway places with strange-sounding names. Nevertheless, the consequence of globalization is that things that happen far away impact us in ways that never did before. And I think we all, as citizens, as a result, bear a responsibility for our own self-interest to try to understand the world better. And I can say as a former journalist, the journalistic community bears a huge responsibility uh, to help us do that. And uh, I can say as a former journalist that my profession uh, has let us down. Um, uh, the ambassador could probably comment on how f many fewer bureaus there are in Tokyo than there used to be. 
Uh, and that's not just because the world's moved on to China or whatever. It's because the economics of journalism has changed and, and we just don't cover the world the way we used to. Uh, this is an ongoing challenge. It's one of the reasons we at the Pew Research Center started to do the Global Attitudes Project over a dozen years ago, is we realized we all need to understand public opinion better, not just in the US, not just in Japan, but all over the world. And um, if we don't, we'll pay a huge price. And I, I couldn't agree with the ambassador more about the, the need to take on that responsibility for all of us as citizens. Just a short comment. Uh, uh, the stereotype of US American image by Japanese public is, you know, uh, is not as positive as that of Japanese stereotype image in the United States, as according to Pew Research result. But I don't think that that is because I don't think that means that US American people is less honest than Japanese. <laughs> but I think that uh, their US is dominant power. So there are massive news coverage about what the president say, or what the Secretary of Defense say, says, or State Department uh, press briefing. And also there are a lot of uh, uh, massive report about presidential race, mm -hmm. or Snowden case, or war in Iraq, or many war, war in Afghanistan, and so on. So naturally, we compare every remark by president or secretary and so on. And there is some contra contradicting remarks, of course, politician. But the Japanese politician also make the same, same very, very contradicting remarks, or there is some scandal by politicians and so on. But it is not covered by yeah. CNN or Fox News. This morning, I, thought, I wanted to know what is going on in the world. So I turned on the CNN. But the four, uh, you know, uh, most of the news were about trial in Boston, like some crime, I, I, which I don't know. So there aren't any world news. So I think that that, not, it, that is largely due to the uh, you know, volume of news coverage. And that gap creates the differences of the stereotype image, I think. OK, well, let's, let's open up to the audience now. We have uh, mics that will be brought to you. Uh, and if you can. Uh, uh, give us your name and affiliation uh, and keep your comments to a, a minimum and focus on question. We'd appreciate it. Who'd like to go first? Over here. Hello. Uh, my name's Matt Tranquata and I'm from Washington Corps. Um, I guess I'd like to ask, uh, I know you guys probably hate to speculate, but I'd like to ask you to look uh, one layer deeper at some of the things you've been talking about. I'm curious what you think some of the drivers are uh, for public opinion here, because while we've been talking about the US and Japan, there are a lot of other countries that are also competing in this marketplace of ideas and public diplomacy. Uh, and one of the trends, especially in DC, has been while Japan's presence hasn't totally gone away, there are fewer exchange students here. There are fewer uh, nonprofits that Japan is funding, while other countries like Korea have really upped their public diplomacy game. And countries like China are uh, funding Confucius Institutes around the country and going after people at sort of different parts of our, uh, our society. Uh, so I guess I'm curious what you see uh, if the, the Japanese uh, relationship with the US will stay unchanged or if there are some other drivers that may uh, influence this beyond just investment in different parts of the country. Well, I do think that the Japanese government recognizes this and is trying to correct that. Uh, my sense in talking to Japanese government officials is they're very aware that they need to up their public diplomacy game. Uh, the Japanese government has a, a goal of uh, doubling the number of Japanese students who study abroad, doubling the number of uh, students from abroad who study in Japan, and a lot of those will be uh, American-Japan uh, exchanges, I think. Uh, now, whether that will be successful or not, we don't know, but I do think that it's um, a sign of recognition that um, uh, Japan's connection to the world had, has declined. Uh, certainly in the 80s when I lived in Japan, uh, you, you could never run into an elite family that wouldn't then brag to you about how their son or their daughter was studying at Harvard. Uh, 
uh, and uh, more very recently, uh, there were no undergraduate Japanese students at Harvard. I mean, it just, it, it's, a, it's a shockingly uh, a graphic example of what was going on. And I do think that, um, uh, yes, there's a greater competition uh, for this pool of people who might be interested in traveling abroad or living abroad or studying abroad. China's now available, it wasn't available. China's hot, Japan is not as hot uh, as an issue for, for younger people. But uh, in that, that competition of ideas, as you say, and, 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 and uh, cultural exposure, uh, I think Japan needs to up its game. And I think it's in our self-interest to, to help support that because uh, if this is the bar none relationship, uh, we have a self-interest in making sure that at many levels, uh, those exchanges uh, are strong. Yeah, uh, thank you for your question. Yeah, I um, uh, agree with a, lo a lot of what Bruce said. Uh, you know, I frame it this way. It seems to me anyways, as a person who tries to work broadly on Asia, that there's something both positive and, and sort of disconcerting about this, which is if you look from roughly 1964 onwards, when Japan became a member of OECD, um, Japan constituted I'm using this number very loosely, but sort of 90% of everything when it came to U.S. Asia, right? It came, it, it came 90% of the economy of Asia, 90% of our interactions on trade and investment and relations with Asia. But Asia's changed. So now you have Japan, um, Korea as a, as a member of the um, advanced countries. You obviously have the rise of China. ASEAN as a grouping represents our third or fourth, give or take, uh, biggest trade partner in the region. Uh, India, to some extent, is also beginning to make changes. So you have a much more uh, diffuse, diversified growth of Asia as a whole. So the relative place of Japan in that context is by definition decreased. The real question is, if we're future oriented, is how does Japan build back the economy along with government directed and, and private sector programs to reinvigorate the US um, Japan relationship. And part of what the Japan Matters for America project or the Asia Matters for America project is about is really, it also provides a mapping of where that work needs to be done and in what areas it needs to be done. So it, it can help us kind of calibrate where we need to do more work, whether it's on the commercial side or the cultural side or the exchange side as, uh, as Bruce said. So that's how I would sort of frame the, the contestation of multiple Asian countries trying to be heard in Washington. Uh, just quickly, I, I think there's one other thing that we should mention in this context of, of fewer Japanese students, and that is the demographic challenge mm -hmm. that Japan is facing. There are just not as many Japanese students as there used to be. Uh, and they're not going, uh, not only are they not going to American universities in the way that they have, they're not going abroad as much as they have because there's just not as many of them. Uh, and that makes the challenge even greater for us that we have to focus on programs that will bring Japanese to America and Americans to Japan. Because without that uh, interaction that we've had, frankly, for 70 years, uh, we're putting at risk this relationship. And it's too valuable to let something like that stand in the way. Uh, and so I don't have an answer for it, but I know that we have to be careful that we don't take each other for granted. Mm -hmm. Now, Ryan Schaefer is here from the Mansfield Foundation. I'm on that board. Here is from the American side. Uh, Mansfield Fellowships, I think, are one of the great things that we do. And what, they, what that is is we take um, mid-career American bureaucrats and take them to Japan. And we used to do that for two years. Now we only do that for a year because the funding was cut back. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the idea of that program was to have young Japanese, young Americans grow up together in government and responsibility so that as they attain more responsibility, the older they got, they would have more interaction. If we put at risk programs like that, we put at risk the future. And we have to be creative and we have to be innovating in getting young Japanese, whether they're in higher education or in mid-career, to the United States and vice versa if we're going to be successful in the long run. Yeah, I think uh, Jerry Curtis not so long ago uh, said about something that on the order of 30 to 40 percent of the decline in, in Japanese students studying here is simply the demographic problems. Uh, 
There's also the, the uh, cost of uh, US university education. So there's also been a diversion to some other English speaking countries, uh, New Zealand, Australia, Canada. So and what's happening in Japan, which is, is ancillary to that, is that it's easier to get in good universities in Japan because there are there's still the infrastructure there Fewer. but fewer applicants. And so the Japanese student has the opportunity, some of them, to go to places that they haven't been able to. It's at home, it's cheaper, it's immensely cheaper uh, than it is in the United States, and that's all playing against us. So we gotta be aware of that. Okay, other questions? Uh, in the back, in white. Uh, thank you, reporter from Voice of America. My question is to you, uh, Mr. Uh, I just wondering, would you, uh, could you help me to clarify one thing? And from the very beginning, you mentioned that it seems to me that President uh, Abe's efforts, like revising Japanese constitution, doesn't uh, actually get a lot of support domestically in Japan. And uh, at the end, you mentioned that there is a trend. It's sort of he got more support. And the second, the Pew Research mentioned that the, 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 the Americans think that Japanese has apologized sufficiently for World War II. So my question is, what does the Japanese public think that they think that they, they apologize sufficiently? Thank you. Thank you. Actually, actually I, must, I, I was waiting, waiting for that question. <laughs> um, as for uh, constitutional revision, I think that uh, yeah, it's still highly divided, as Paul shows. And it is uh, more difficult to uh, anticipate trend about the trend about uh, support of related to constitutional revision than support to more proactive security policy. Because constitutional revision is a much bigger deal. So I'm not sure that the trend is moving, will move more toward division or it, or it will remain divided. I'm not so sure about the, as for the constitutional division. But for proactive uh, security policy, I think that the trend will be more to be supportive of that. And as for the uh, apology, uh, actually, uh, <coughs> I, I think this way. Uh, before that, maybe there is a, there was a, uh, maybe I should mention about another poll, poll conducted by Yomiri newspaper in January, and they is, uh, ask uh, whether uh, Japanese apology for wartime act is sufficient or not, and I think that uh, more uh, more than 50 percent, uh, vast majority of people think that it is sufficient, but at the same time, uh, if Paul asked if Prime Minister Abe, uh, he's, uh, he's uh, uh, making a statement on uh, August 15th for the 90, 70 years anniversary for the World War II. And uh, specifically about this statement, another poll asked if uh, Prime Minister Abe should include the wording of uh, Japanese colonization, or I, I forgot the uh, exact wording, but heartful apology and also should mention about aggression. Those wording are also uh, put in the Murayama statement. And then uh, more people, about 50 people, percent of the people think that Prime Minister Abe should include. Uh, while 17% uh, or 30% of people should not, think Abe should not, or do not, do not need to. So, I think the sentiment of ordinary Japanese people about apology is that Japanese leaders have apologized many times and it is maybe sufficient. But it doesn't mean that Japan, it is time for Japan to forget. It, it doesn't mean that the public think that it is time for Japan to forget about future past and ignore about uh, past. It's a different thing. So uh, people support uh, for Prime Minister to make a statement uh, which mentioned which mention, uh, about heartful apology. 
or aggression, that kind of wording. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I, just one small point. I think on collective self-defense, the um, that I believe is something of a moving target in terms of people's perceptions because the uh, uh, U.S.-Japan guidelines won't be coming out until when the prime minister comes and and the uh, debate that will ensue over over both that and the uh, uh, the legislation that will implement that will be ongoing over the next few months. So I think it'll be interesting to watch and see how and whether public perceptions uh, change on that particular issue. Other questions? Abigail. Hi, Abigail Friedman with the Wisteria Group. Thank you so much, uh, really instructive. Um, good work went into this. My question is, after looking at all of this survey, uh, what strikes me is that American attitudes towards Japan are pretty positive and pretty much where we would want them to be. Positive on trade, positive on the security relationship, positive in terms of public perceptions of Japanese. Um, so I'm a little more worried about Japanese perceptions of uh, Americans. Um, uh, not very hardworking not too trustworthy, <laughs> um, sort of this maybe begrudging, um, uh, well, these are the people we have to do business with. But uh, So my question is really for Ambassador Schaefer, having been ambassador uh, to Japan, um, what, uh, what would be your recommendations for how to uh, improve Japanese perceptions of uh, Americans? Abigail. <laughs> <laughs> That's a tough one. Uh, I think we have to not take Japan for granted. And I think we have to approach Japan more as an equal and get away from this old model uh, that we know best. Uh, I don't think we have that attitude when we talk to the British. I don't think we have that attitude when we talk to the Germans. Uh, we certainly don't have that attitude when we talk to the Australians. If you, if you try that with the Australians, you'll get thrown out the door. Um, and so I think we have to stop that kind of aspect of, of thinking that a heavy hand in Japan will improve our chances of success. I think we have to be forthright. We have to say what we're going to do while we think it's in, in our interest and why we think it's in the interest in Japan. We worked very hard when I was there uh, on uh, uh, bringing a nuclear carrier to Japan. Uh, a lot of people in this country said that will never happen. A lot of people in Japan said that will never happen because of, of the attitude the, uh, as a result of the bomb, which you still see in, in this survey. But I thought the most dramatic thing that changed things was when Prime Minister Koizumi said, the USS George Washington, which was a nuclear aircraft carrier, and because we went to an all-nuclear fleet at that point in time, Prime Minister Koizumi said, this aircraft carrier is coming to Japan for the defense of Japan. It is in our interest, it is in our security interest for that carrier to be here. And when that happened, and we did a lot of work, and both governments did a lot of work on trying to to sensitize uh, each side to what the other's position was, and I think it bore fruit. But when he said that, it changed the dynamics of the argument. It was not the United States is has the right to do this, and therefore we're going to. It was a collaborative effort, but he took ownership of the issue. And when he did that, it changed everything. And when the carrier actually got there, there were a few hundred demonstrators. When conventional carriers in the past had, had brought 20, 30,000 people to the docks to, to when they got there, that's a huge difference. It was better. And when you see something happen in uh, North Korea now, and the George Washington is in the, in the Sea of Japan, I think it gives the Japanese people some comfort uh, and I think that's the way we ought to treat things in the future. I think it's also important to recognize, if, but correct me if I'm wrong, Bruce, that these are personality traits that, that were being, that were negative, whereas the trust between 
Japan and the U.S. is, is pretty high. And I, I would imagine, I haven't seen the polling, but I would imagine uh, as compared to other countries, we're probably better trusted than just about anyone else. And we should also bear in mind that it doesn't necessarily reflect reality. Uh, the latest OECD figures show that Americans actually work more hours per year than the Japanese do. That the, 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 the Japanese, when I first moved to Japan, all Japanese worked on Saturdays. <laughs> That's not the case. They, they, part of the change in Japan was to get rid of that kind of, of, of intense uh, uh, work life that led no, left no opportunity for consumption which we, of course, wanted the Japanese to do more of. Um, and I, so I do think that, uh, but these, these stereotypes linger, basically. I thought the ambassador's point that, you know, when you try to disassemble, why did the Japanese see us as aggressive? You know, I had thought about it, well, maybe they think, you know, we have this cowboy image in the world, et cetera. But I think he's probably right, that it may have to do more with the sense that the Americans were, for 20 years have been pushing us to do X, Y, and Z, and that translates to the average person as well, they're pretty aggressive people. Um, now, we're gonna continue to be aggressive on issues that are in our national self-interest, there's no doubt about that, uh, so I don't necessarily see that as a, a totally negative thing either, uh, but I think the ambassador's right that there are consequences to the gaiatsu, and this may be, this may be one of them. Other questions? Uh, Samar Chatterjee Save Foundation. Um, um, since a lot of questions have been asked about honesty and so on, I won't go into that. Uh, I think it's been addressed. Uh, my question is, has America apologized, and this may be for Mr. Arita, uh, has apologized for dropping of those atom bombs? And is that an issue in Japan? And will that create, if it did, if America did apologize for it, will it create a better trust or c consider Americans more honest? <laughs> you ask me a very tough question. <laughs> um, I think that uh, it is natural for many Japanese people think that a dropping a uh, decision to drop nuclear bomb to Hiroshima and Nagasaki was wrong. And uh, while U.S. think that it was uh, inevitable. So this, you know, uh, it is natural that there's a difference. And I think that the, it, uh, for the first time, uh, U.S. ambassador, uh, US ambas as an American ambassador based in Tokyo, I think uh, Mr. Ruth, uh, Ambassador Ruth, uh, went to Hiroshima and attended the uh, ceremony on August 6th, the Memorial Day of the new Hiroshima. And it was high reported in a very favorable way. And Japanese people feel very, very, <coughs> uh, you know, Japanese pleased to see that U.S. ambassador was in Hiroshima on that, that uh, event. And also there is a uh, discussion that uh, for president in the future, president, whether uh, discussion that, discussion hope that uh, someday American president will visit Hiroshima. Not necessarily does, but it doesn't mean that Japanese people want to <coughs> uh, demand some clear apology, but uh, as a symbol of uh, reconciliation, it is good things to happen. While maybe it is good for a Japanese prime minister to visit Pearl Harbor in the future and show the act of reconcile. So I think that apology some people uh, uh, pay, make much of apology, but I think more important thing is to reconcile, reconciliation. And of, of course, apology is one element of uh, reconciliation, but uh, paying too much attention about to how much extent you apologize. I don't, I'm not so sure that it is uh, constructive for the real reconciliation. 
you have them. Yeah, in fact, uh, next year, Japan will be the host for the G7, and uh, I believe there are only three cities in contention to host that. One of, one of uh, the cities is Hiroshima, so mm -hmm. if that happens, the, the president will, will be there. Other questions? Right here, gentleman here. Uh, Henry Hetker, researcher at NARA. Um, this year, uh, rather late last year, we heard reports that uh, there wasn't sufficient quality control uh, in the production of airbags at Takata. I wonder, there was other companies like American companies, GM, uh, Ford, where they've made mistakes as well, um, and then try to cover up what they did. But well, quality control is essential to product safety. Uh, is there a way to ensure and provide that quality control exists in any company, uh, especially where uh, the public is endangered to some extent from what they produce? Any product safety experts here? Uh? I, I think your point is well taken. Uh, I think the underlying assumption is everybody's got to be responsible for what they do, and they have to be transparent to as great a degree as they can. There are many overlapping regulations on both Japan and the United States that are designed to keep things like the airbag situation from happening or like the GM situation, the ignition problem from happening, uh, but they don't always succeed. Uh, and I think what you have to have is the ability to, to get redress in either place for the actions you've taken. And I think we largely are able to do that. Uh, but it is a process, and sometimes it works better than others. And your, and your question, it seems to me, presages what is the next phase in Japanese-American economic integration if, in, if we get TPP. Yeah. Mm -hmm. TTIP, which is the negotiation with Europe, actually is an attempt to begin to develop common standards across the Atlantic. It's terribly ambitious. It may not work. We may, have, we may encounter the limitations of any kind of integration exercise once we start to get into this process. But it does seem to me if the, if the transatlantic uh, exercise does begin to develop uh, not only common regulations, but common procedures for actually developing future regulations, that the logical next step in TPP, or at least certainly between Japan and the United States, would be to begin to adapt. Now, that may be 20 years down the road, but I do think that that, uh, you know, what you are getting at is the next phase of global globalization, uh, yeah, and whether that's politically doable at home in either country, whether it's technically doable is a challenge. Uh, what we're still trying to figure out. Yeah, and, and, and I, I, that's exactly right. But I think that the free trade agreements now that we're negotiating are much more sophisticated in that regard than they have been in the past. Tariffs are not the hard thing anymore. It's what do you have behind the tariff that may inhibit trade. And we both, both sides, and it's not confined to the United States or Japan, everybody tries to put their thumb on the scale in some way with the regulatory environment that they create on their side to keep the other guys' products out of, out of, out of, the, out of their country. But I do think that we're moving in the right direction on that. And I think that you'll, you're seeing a trade environment that spreads prosperity. And the, the best example that I know of is, is Canada, the United States, Mexico with NAFTA. Uh, the, what it has done for both, econ uh, for all three economies is just incredible. And I think that that's the way we ought to go in the future. And it, it does seem to me that, that one of the opportunities going forward for Japan and the United States is we are both increasingly dependent on foodstuffs that come out of China uh, and pharmaceutical products, uh, at least raw materials that come out of uh, China. We have, a self in we have a mutual self interest in the safety of those products. Uh, we and the Europeans have the same challenge, and one of the things the Europeans and Americans are talking about is uh, 
none of us inspect the factories and the production facilities in China as much as we should, but if we would trust each other to inspect one and then we wouldn't have to inspect it, we could, we could inspect twice as many of these yeah. facilities. It seems to me the Japanese and the Americans could conceivably do the same kinds of things going forward. Other questions? I, I think there was, yeah, no, over here. Yeah, hello. Um, my name is Gregory Gums. I'm an independent uh, writer. Um, in one of the uh, surveys, it was pointed out that there's a difference between um, basically a Protestant, Anglo-Saxon, Americans' uh, view of uh, Japan and their trust in Japan and minorities' view and trust of Japan. It somewhat surprised me, to be honest with you. Um, because, for example, if you take African Americans, right? African Americans originally, uh, early on in the 20th century, right? Looked towards Japan, right? Uh, they had a high view of Japan, especially Japan's view of a coming power, et cetera, et cetera, and being people that were seeing as, you know, as not relevant or can't develop yourself. And also because of the role Japan played during World War I in trying to push for the equality amendment, right? Uh, to say that, you know, uh, there's not going to be kind of white countries and then the rest, uh, you know, I, I come from the Caribbean and the rest don't count. I mean, look, the Caribbean doesn't count. I do understand that to a certain extent. But this is an, this is an issue, and the, the, the question is, obviously with the, democratic, with the demographic makeover of America, right, this becomes a major problem for, for Japan. If it cannot gain a greater, to a certain extent, although it's, a, it's a still a majority, it cannot gain a greater uh, certain acceptance with that coming group. So what is Japan doing there? How do you see some ways of uh, doing something about this? That's the first question. The second question is the ambassador, you said that, um, uh, you know, the, the relationships between Japan and the United States, it has been quite uh, one-dimensional in the sense that the United States, uh, you know, has been very, uh, Japan has been quite dependent on the United States for its, for its defense. Um, but the issue is, how much would the United States really want, ultimately, Japan to become much more uh, independent of the United States in, uh, in going forward and doing its own uh, defense, especially <coughs> with the background of, of uh, the coming uh, power of obviously of China, which can, this, this can create a great problem because of the fact that, uh, you know, there's still a lot of hurt feelings in that region because there's, there's this sense that Japan simply has not, unlike to a certain extent Germany, really, really apologized for what it did and the horrific things it did in Shanghai, et cetera, et cetera. So thank you. Yeah, give me the, First, the first question on, on the uh, non-whites support of Japan. Right. I, I frankly was surprised at that. Uh, I, I must say, I, I, I just didn't think in terms of that. Um, and I, I, I think I'm going to need to think about that a little bit more before I can come up with a, a recommendation. But um, on, the, on, the, on the other part of it, uh, on does the United, should the United States fear an in, a more independent Japan? And the answer is no. Uh, I think, but I don't draw the same conclusion to that that I think that your question uh, implies. I think a Japan that comes to the, con to, that, that thinks of itself as a independent country that is trying to persuade others to achieve what is in the best interest of Japan is a Japan that will be working hand in glove with the United States. I don't think those are exclusive. Uh, the United Kingdom is, is a pretty independent uh, country. I don't think that they, they the, the UK thinks that it has to do everything that the United States does, and they don't. But over time, we've had no closer ally that has performed in more places with us than the UK. I think what I'm trying to say is, if you look at what I believe are Japan's long-term interests and what the United States' long-term interests are in Northeast Asia and the rest of the world, I think they're com very compatible. 
And I don't think we have to have a senior junior partner in the alliance. I think two equal partners will come to the same conclusions for the same reasons. It's in our mutual interest. And there's always a debate in as to whether it should be a three-corner uh, relationship with Japan, China, and the United States. Are there, is it a triangle relationship in which two are always angling uh, against one, or whether it should be a seesaw relationship? I think it works better for the United States and Japan when it's a seesaw. We're on one side of the seesaw, and China is on the other. And when that happens, I think it's easier to bring everything in balance. If it's a trilateral triangle, I think something's always out of balance. And we have to be very, very careful, I think, that we don't allow uh, others to drive a wedge between the United States and Japan, because I think that would be injurious to us, and I think it would be injurious in the long run to Japan. We're almost out of time, so why don't we collect uh, a couple of questions, and then we'll uh, give each of our speakers a chance to answer those if they choose, or, or simply provide some summary comments. So why don't we go here <coughs> and there, the three. Well, my name is Sasawe Harris, retired from the State Department. I just wanted to make a comment about this so-called hardworking Japanese and the seemingly slovenly. <coughs> well, uh, I go back a little ways. I think I'm probably older than most of you here. I was in Japan in 43, and uh, when I entered Keio University, we had to go on military marches and running. And they said, Wehara, can you make it? I said, what do you mean, can I make it? Well, you're half Caucasian. Well, I said, well, so what? Ah, but you see, they're not as tough as we are. That's where the, the attitude, the basic fundamental attitude still persists. I, I was quite surprised that, and well, I did survive. I did as much as, as well as any of the other Japanese students. So the attitude changed after that, the, how they looked at me. That, uh, that is a story from 1943. I was then 18 years old, 19 years old. The other one is about the holidays. We now brag about we work harder than the Japanese. Well, you know, there is a story to that. Uh, maybe all of you know about it, but it's not been mentioned here. We complain to the Japanese that's a non-tariff barrier. And will you please change it? So the Japanese were persuaded by the US government to put in, quote, more holidays so that you Japanese don't work as hard. And one of them, Uminohi, the day, the day for celebrating the sea, that the one I can remember. So this is a two-way deal. We now say that we work harder than the Japanese or work a day more. Well, that's partly because we put the pressure on the Japanese in the 80s and 90s to, to rectify the non-tariff barrier. Uh, and therefore, the Japanese were persuaded to take on more holidays. Uh, it's not a question. It's a clarification to all of you here. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, uh, the others? Who, uh, I'm uh, Mark Tokola from the Korea Economic Institute. I wanted to follow up on Ambassador Schieffer's comparison of the triangle versus the seesaw. You know, given Japan's strong distrust of China, as we saw in the polling, his perception of China as being a threat, perhaps. What does Japan want for from the U.S.-Chinese relationship? If the U.S.-Chinese relations uh, took a sharp upturn and improved, would Japan see those being to their disadvantage? And over here. Thank you, James. Uh, independent uh, reporter. Uh, it's interesting that uh, the other gentleman also follow up with uh, the ambassador's um, uh, a comment on the triangle relations. But there's another triangle relations there. Uh, South Korea, Japan, US. So that's within a family. But uh, we all know that as one uh, expert pointed out, I don't see how you operate with an ally uh, 
the relation between South Korea and Japan, uh, you know, at a certain point in uh, their headache uh, over history issues. And do you see any uh, possible uh, future that the two side uh, between, I mean, between Japan and, uh, and South Korea, uh, that they're going to crack at the ally there? Uh, especially when, when you talk about the grand U.S. strategy rebalance to Asia. Thank you very much. Okay, why don't we go in reverse order from how we began, and Akita-san, if you'd like to answer any of those questions or simply provide some, some summary comments. As for uh, hard-working question, I think, I think this way. Um, when I was, I, I still remember that when I was a kid, my father goes to, went, to the, went, went to work every Saturday, and sometime even on Sunday. So I think that a stereotype of Japanese image of Japanese public is that Japanese people is very, very, very hardworking, and that is one of the area we can be proud most. So uh, Paul, <laughs> when you ask Japanese people whether US is hardworking or not, criteria is too high. So it is, uh, Paul, you know, Paul is asking this question to the wrong, wrong people, I think. <laughs> so if you, uh, so I, I, again, I don't think that uh, you, uh, American people is not hardworking in a global standard, but the, in comparison to Japanese stereotype image, the Japanese think that, that we are more hardworking. That is a, a, a answer. And about the U.S.-Japan alliance, I think that there is uh, two models. One is U.S.-U.K. model, share all indigenous information and share strategy, and always, uh, most of the time, act together, even in the war in Iraq. But another model is U.S. maybe, it's not alliance, but U.S.-French model. Maybe France is a close, uh, close partner of the U.S., but also they want to maintain a free hand. They have an independent nuclear uh, strategy, and so on. And uh, so there's a spectrum to which Japan can approach in the future. I think that this model, UK, U.S., this model, this model is a very, you know, uh, maybe Japan cannot copy this, but I think that the direction is supposed to be this, toward this direction uh, when we look at the Asian security situation. And uh, about the US-Japan-Korean uh, uh, triangular cooperation, I think after all, uh, whether uh, to how much extent we can share the threat perception or a strategic purpose, goal, is the main variable about this relationship. And uh, I wonder if to how much extent Japanese, Japanese and Koreans' perception about the rise of China or China's military expansion is uh, stay on the same you know, domain or, or same or similar. Because uh, I remember that there is a lot of discussion about the deployment of new uh, missile defense system by US to Korea, South Korea. But there's, uh, China is opposing to that, and I'm wondering if uh, South Korea will, government eventually will accept its deployment. I think I, South Korea will, but uh, because uh, South Korea is located, it, uh, is a part of a continent, while Japan is separated by sea from China. So that makes it more difficult, I think. Well, that is a challenge for more closer cooperation in long term, I think. Thank you. Ambassador? Well, I'll do it quickly. Hard working. Uh, doesn't everybody think the other guy doesn't work as hard as I do? <laughs> um, if you look at the baseball, though, uh, I'm in the baseball business. I'll, I'll give you a little insight into this question. American infields at a ballpark, at a major league ballpark, will have grass in them, okay? In Japan, they'll all be dirt. You know why that is? because the Japanese players take so much infield, hitting the ball to the shortstop, practicing, that if you had grass in an infield at a Japanese park, it would have holes in it where all of the balls are hit. So they took the grass out. 
Now, I'll leave that to you as to who's the most hardworking baseball player <laughs> in the world. Uh, what does happens to, does the United States really want uh, Japan to be independent or if we had good relationship with China? I'm gonna tell you a real prejudice I have. I don't think we can have good relations with China unless we have a strong alliance with Japan. I'm talking about that as an American. I think Japan's chances of having good relations with Japan are determined largely by the relationship that they have with the United States. It's in our interest to act together. And when we act together, I think we have a moderating influence on China and its foreign policy. Finally, on the Korea-Japan, um, interesting thought. I has Bruce is the authority on, on numbers here, but I think Americans are surprised at the animosity that exists between South Koreans and Japanese. They frankly don't understand it. Why should this be? But if you say that it'll never be better, I would, I would go back with the history of NATO. And when NATO was formed, there was an internal argument as to whether Germany should be a part of NATO. The Netherlands were violently opposed to Germany being a part of NATO for, I would guess, obvious reasons. Uh, that's overcome. And now Germany is a vital part of NATO, and I think everybody agrees, all the NATO members that think that's a positive thing. I think we can all look forward to the day when South Korea and Japan sit down together as friends who trust each other the way they each trust the United States. I think the world would be a safer place if that were the occasion. Satu? Yeah, there wasn't anything specific, uh, absolutely. But let me just sort of end on two comments given what we worked with SPF USA on, uh, which is, you know, these impacts and interactions of Japan and the U.S. Um, uh, across the country. Um, two things. One is um, I was struck by Bruce's public opinion. One thing that didn't come out to me very strongly is that for all of these quibbles about hardworking or trustworthy or all these, first, the general trend line of the the attitudes towards the U.S. and Japan in, in 2015 compared to 20 or 30 years ago is just light years different and more positive. So these strike me as very minor quibbles about who works harder, et cetera, um, which in a, in a kind of globalized production si supply chain economy, I think work smarter is far more important than work harder. How do you manage the supply chain? And where do you fit into it? And where do you have efficiencies? So that's one comment on this whole uh, spectrum of, of issues. The second is, in the public opinion polling, it kept striking me that for the differences, particularly on views of where we would rank China as a, as a problem, et cetera, um, there don't seem to be any strong drivers to change the U.S.-Japan relationship. That it seems to me on both sides, there is a, a sort of comfort level while people tinker around the edges. There's no huge chasms on either side. Uh, about these issues. So that's what I wanted to say on, on the public opinion and, and, and the polling. On the larger context of foreign policy and security, I mean, the, uh, leave it to the ambassador, but I guess one thing I would say in the work we've done on mapping how Asia matters across America is, as I, I want to repeat, f for many states and districts, Japan used to be 90% of everything when it came to Asia because Japan was that big of an economy it was that big of an ally. It was that big of a source of our commercial, tourist, and other relations. But that situation has changed. There are now more players in Asia, and their interactions and impacts on the US are now jostling with Japan's impacts and interactions in the US. And in looking forward, it seems to me what we have to think about to reinvigorate or further invigorate the US-Japan relationship is in this changed context, how do you build on the underlying strengths of the U.S.-Japan relationship? And what programs, what initiatives, what activities do we need to think about uh, to take advantage of what I think is a fairly stabilized um, and largely positive public opinion and material facts on the ground? So that's, 
I would add to that. Um, two things. On, on uh, the U.S.-China-Japan triangle, um, uh, there does seem to be a potential there where, where the, while Americans overwhelmingly believe they want to become closer to Japan because of the rise of China, that doesn't mean that they also don't want a closer economic relationship with China. Uh, whereas the Japanese, if forced to choose, choose a closer economic relationship with the United States. Uh, so if, there's, if a problem arises here, I think it's more going to be in the minds of the Japanese than in the Americans about this, in, isn't there an inherent contradiction here somewhere? Um, but I think Japanese should remember that Americans have very little trust of China, and they have uh, a very high level of concern, our other polls have shown, very high level of concern among Americans about our trade deficit with China, with the fact that jobs are moving to China, and that the fact that the Chinese all hold a lot of American debt. Uh, so I think that will um, uh, sober any embrace of China uh, by the American people, not necessarily the elites, because the elites look at this differently. We Our surveys show that American elites are much more worried about China's military rise uh, and not its economic rise. So that's, that's an interesting contradiction. On South Korea, um, I agree with the ambassador. I think most Americans are unaware of the tensions for the most part uh, and can't understand them. Our, this survey uh, that you have in front of you, uh, we did ask people about uh, the comfort women issue between Korea and uh, Japan, and over half of Americans had never heard of the issue. Uh, so I do think that it's it's not that that uh, prominent in people's uh, views uh, in terms of what's going on in Asia. We're much more aware of the North Korean missile problem uh, or the territorial disputes between Japan and, and China. Terrific. Well, I, I really want to thank all our, our speakers for an excellent job and a rich discussion. Before. Uh, we give them our applause. Just one quick announcement. We are running a little bit behind time. Uh, we've got a uh, buffet lunch in back, but I'm told that uh, if all of you can let the speakers uh, cut to the front of the line, especially <laughs> Admiral Blair, who has to uh, yes. eat quickly and speak next, we'd appreciate it. But, but please join me in, in thanking all our speakers today. Thank you very much.